So, uh, hi, I'm Powell, and I'm one of the authors or creators of Trezor, the Bitcoin safe. And I hope you will learn something new about our efforts. So, first, let me introduce the team. This is uh, me and Marek, but unfortunately, you can see, see it's a rather dark photo. Uh, we, it's a photo taken in uh, Brumlab hackerspace, which is uh, located in Prague. So maybe that's better. Uh, so f the first author is uh, Marek Palatinus, better known as Slush, who is basically innovator, inventor of shared-based mining pools concept. He came with the idea and then uh, the first implementation of the idea, which is basically used in other pools as well. Uh, he's still operator of this first mining pool, which is uh, located on mining.bitcoin.cz, also known as Slush Pool. Uh, at the moment, it's fourth largest, with uh, somewhere between 10 and 50% of power or hash rate. And he also designed a uh, lightweight protocol, Stratum, which is nowadays used by pools, miners, and clients. Uh, the old protocol was uh, uh, was not 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 good enough for mining, especially when new devices like FPGAs and mining came, uh, ASIC came. Then it uh, created a huge load on the server, so he created the new protocol that's mo much more efficient. And I'm the second author. I'm Pavel, and uh, I was one of one of the founders of the Bermlab hackerspace, like I said. Uh, I'm open source enthusiast, which will have some effects later. Uh, I'm a software, and recently I became a hardware developer, a few years ago. And I did some various uh, smaller Bitcoin-related projects, like, for example, coinmap.org, which is basically uh, a, f a feed taken from OpenStreetMap uh, where, where venues have a uh, special Bitcoin tag, and it will uh, show, show the map of such venues uh, which have this tag enabled. And the second project is uh, just a work name, Edergen, ed 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 like address generator, which basically uh, you take your Electrum uh, master public key, and it will generate a series of addresses. And it's uh, supporting uh, PHP, uh, Python and Ruby, so it's if you have applications written in that languages, uh, you can use it on your server, which is quite a convenient and safe way because you store just the public information on your server. So even if, if you are hacked, then still you are in possession of, of your Bitcoins. So w why such thing like Trezor? Because people lose money. Like there were lots of uh, evidence in the past uh, for the f I think the first Bitcoin theft was around uh, 50,000 US dollars stolen. And even back then, the Bitcoin wasn't uh, at $100 per one piece. So uh, when we, uh, if we uh, used today's exchange rate, that, that would be even, even higher. And these are just some uh, new, new news titles from Reddit and other websites. So the, the problem why people lose money is mainly security of end-user computer because uh, sorry because uh, these computers are or can become compromised if you have malware that basically steals uh, your wallet file and you are effectively effectively without your bitcoins. Then uh, another problem is untrusted computers. If, if, if uh, the computer you want to use is not in your possession, you just go to some internet cafe and you can't trust, uh, can't trust this device at all. And also uh, the problem, which is not prominent now, but may maybe later, is fake client. So it's basically an uh, application that behaves exactly like the real client, but does something completely different. And you have no way of... Uh, you have no way of uh, knowing that something wrong is happening. And another problem is uh, you can lose your wallet even if you are not exposed to the threats in on the previous slides. For example, hard drive failures. You know, it's hard drive, it's electronics, they tend to break when you don't expect it, so you can lose bitcoins. 
other uh, problem is naive system reinstalls. You know, system is broken. You just decide to reinstall it. Oh, forgot to back up my wallet. I'm screwed. And also, also an unexpected disasters. You know, na nature, like thunderstorms, floods, or fire. You will lose bitcoins as well. And of course, uh, failing to do proper backups. Even if you even if you uh, do backups while system reinstall, reinstall, you probably just do a backup on another hard drive, which is at the same location or even worse in the same computer. So, it, it proper backup uh, is something that not a lot of people are doing correctly. So we think that hardware wallets are the way. And. Uh, yeah, I th see you agree. So that's why we came with Trezor. Uh, maybe you are wondering why the name. We were trying to come up with some fancy name. And the problem with most of the Bitcoin-related project, projects is they either start with Bit or Coin or end with something similar. So we were like. Uh, Maybe we should come up with some name that's quite unique. And uh, we, we had a discussion with one of our friends, and he said, why not Trezor? And we were like, well, it's, it's a Slavic word, which means safe or vault. But in other languages, except probably German and Russian, uh, it doesn't have any meaning. So maybe it, it would be nice. And uh, also, uh, they thought that a lot of English-speaking people will think that Trezor is something like treasure, so something you 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 like and you 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 possess. The problem is uh, most of the American people when they see Trezor they think of Trent Reznor from Nine Nails, but it's it's also not bad. So the idea behind Trezor is uh, to create a dedicated single-purpose mini computer, which allows secure transaction on an untrusted computer, like I mentioned in the previous slides. So uh, even even if I came uh, to Internet Cafe, I don't have to trust the computer at all because all of the security measures are in this small device, which is basically disconnected from the internet and cannot be cannot be hacked because uh, the protocol which is uh, which which it is using to communicate with the computer doesn't uh, allow to do such stuff. Maybe I will have that in the slides later. So. Uh, and of course, if you have such uh, software, it needs a cooperating Bitcoin client. So uh, we are not yet there, but I will talk about this later. So uh, the solution is to separate the private keys from the client, so they are not present on these untrusted computers. Uh, the client prepares transaction, which is then sent to Trezor us using this uh, protocol. Uh, it's signed there. And the private keys never leave the Trezor. So the only thing that is returned back is the signed transaction. So uh, basically, if you, are, uh, if you are not a power user, you don't even have to know there are some private keys. It's, it's your Trezor that does the work. So we don't have to even think about private keys or backing them up. And uh, also, we try to use minimalistic design because we learned from the previous attempts. There were like maybe five or ten attempts to create some super special universal Bitcoin wallet with uh, wireless connection and RGB display and uh, camera to scan QR codes. But basically what these teams were doing, they uh, created a very cheap copy of phone, but they n never even got to the point where they should try to solve the security problem. They were just imitating this phone. And this uh, was so exhaustive that they never got to the real real thing. So we also don't have battery because we use power from USB. And we don't need internet access because we just we are just stupid transaction signer device. Uh, the computer provides internet access. And also we don't have keypad. We just have yes and no buttons. I will show the workflow later how, how it works. But we have display where uh, you basically see the transaction and you can verify it. So that's uh, basically a measure against these fake clients which can spoof the transaction. And if you have, for example, a smart card that's signing a Bitcoin transaction, you, you are safe in a way that it's 
probably not uh, not uh, not signing transaction that shouldn't be signed, but uh, you, you you don't know which which transaction are sent into the device. So if you have the spoofed client, then it can uh, send different different transactions that are actually on on display. So basically, in a nutshell, we have an embedded device that's the design in a durable case and running a dedicated software. Well, it's too bad you can't see the photos, but the slides, slides are going to be online. So let's dig into technical details uh, about hardware. We are using ARM Cortex-M3 microcontroller. It's from uh, ST Microelectronics, which is a company very well known for their very strong series of ARM microcontrollers. It has 120 megahertz, which is much, much faster than, for example, Arduino, but it's slower than uh, BeagleBoard or Raspberry Pi, so it's somewhere in, in, uh, in between these two well-known uh, options. It has a half megabyte of flash, which you probably think it's uh, not too much, but for embedded programming it's quite enough. And uh, 120 kilobytes of RAM, which is also quite, uh, quite enough when compared to, to Arduino. And also uh, it, uh, it has a hardware random generator, so we, we use that for, uh, for, uh, for generating seeds. No, 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 not just this hardware generator but we use it wa as one of the entropy sources. And also it has OLED display, uh, which is that no model number, which is basically around one inch with uh, uh, 128 uh, times 64 pixels. Uh, these are monochromatic, which is enough, but uh, I heard recently that uh, China vendors are working on, on the same display with the same uh, technical parameters, but it's, uh, it's colorful. It has uh, true color. And of course, it has two tactile buttons for saying yes and no. Well, the firmware, it's written in C. Uh, it's open source. And also, we don't use any proprietary tool chains. We use just the normal GCC ARM port and a lib open cm3 which is an open effort to uh, to support these uh, cortex m processors uh, that's also good because uh, for example uh, commercial versions of uh, tool chains like kyle they usually don't support uh, usb in this uh, lower versions so if you want to use uh, Kyle, uh, with full USB support, you have to order the the most expensive option, which is quite quite a lot of money per developer. Uh, when it comes to communication, we use uh, protocol buffers, uh, which is an effort from uh, Google to serialize uh, binary binary data, and we use uh, USB H uh, ID or human interface uh, device. Uh, as, a, as a physical layer. That has one advantage, that basically you don't need uh, any drivers in Windows, Linux, or Mac OS, or any, possibly any other operating system, because uh, these operating systems already, already support this uh, physical layer because of uh, mouse, or keyboards, or joysticks. Also, the design is pretty simple, so we don't use any uh, OS like free RTOS or <coughs> or similar. It's just our s s custom software, so we basically don't uh, don't use any concurrency or threads, which is quite uh, easy to audit, and you don't have phrase conditions and so on. At least not because of the threads. <laughs> Uh, and now I will show how how uh, some workflows are performed. So when you when you first run Trezor, it will show show a logo, and then it will start to generate seed. This seed is uh, I'm I'm not sure if you are aware of uh, Electrum client and how it works, but basically uh, it generates some uh, entropy. In Electrum is it's 128 bits. We probably use more. And this entropy is then used to generate an uh, infinite number of uh, private keys and corresponding addresses. 
So all you, if you want to backup, you just need to keep this uh, seed. And uh, Trezor has the same idea. It's, it will generate, generate the seed, which is stored in this device. And then Trezor uh, can uh, basically can provide infinite number of addresses you, you, you can use. So it, it will generate a seed. Then this seed is transformed into some uh, English words, like, for example, constant forest, adore, blah, blah, blah. And when you note these uh, words on a piece of paper and put in a real, real safe, or you just memorize it if you are a native speaker or you know English perfectly. And uh, that's basically it. If, if someone uh, uh, steals your treasure or it's broken, then you, you just need these 12 words to basically restore all your Bitcoin addresses and, and uh, Bitcoin stored in it. And uh, using this, uh, this sentence, you can either import these addresses to another Trezor or to some other client. Sorry? You mean the seed? Yeah. It's stored in uh, Flash, on Flash memory, in, inside of Trezor. And uh, these words uh, are being generated by an algorithm which will uh, be standardized as BIP0039. Uh, uh, it's heavily inspired by what uh, Thomas designed for Electrum client, but we will do some changes with regards to word selection because there are some, uh, uh, let me say, problems for non-native non speaker uh, users like there are words like built uh, in present tense and built in the past tense and it's it's e even hard to dictate over telephone or something like that and so that's basically the first workflow you will encounter immediately after you uh, start using Trezor and the most uh, the most used uh, workflow is of course sending bitcoins so when you first uh, start your client, it will say, please connect your Trezor. You will do so. And uh, basically what happens is that a uh, uh, client running on your computer says, please give me your master public key and Trezor will do so. And now, that now the client knows which addresses uh, are stored in Trezor and knows how many Bitcoins are there. So client now knows there are essentially 12 Bitcoins stored in Trezor. Now we can se click send. Let's send 10 Bitcoins to Bob. Let's send set fee. And uh, this transaction is created in client and sent to Trezor with some uh, fields uh, empty. And now Trezor will say, uh, please retype these one-time passwords into your client. So it will basically generate some random string. And you have to copy this uh, string to the client. And then you uh, have to enter the pin again in your client. Uh, the thing uh, with the one-time password is uh, to protect you from uh, brute forcing the pin code. Because pin code is uh, something you, you set during the initia initialization. And we use the one-time password to protect you. For example, if you are in, in some pub and go to the toilet, then some people might try to brute force your password. And this, this pin is entered on, uh, com on your computer. Yes. Yeah, I know. Uh, we are aware of this, but we think that uh, when combined with the OTP, then uh, the pin is not, uh, you know, it's not so sensitive. It's uh, we, we can discuss about later, and we probably will. <laughs> <laughs> so n now Trezor tr is shown the transaction that we are sending uh, 10 bitcoins to that address, and now I can either cancel the transaction, which aborts the whole project uh, process, or confirm the transaction, which will uh, just uh, fill in the missing fields in the transaction template, which are signatures, 
and this transaction is sent back to the client, which will uh, then propagate it to network. So uh, Trezor is an offline, offline signer, which just signs the transaction. And of course, client can now update the balance, and <coughs> you can either send another transaction or just pl uh, plug, plug out uh, your wallet. So what about the client support? Well, having a hardware is nice, but we have to teach all these major Bitcoin clients how to use it. And the current state is, uh, yeah, I'm <coughs> I skipped some slides. So what we are doing in that effort is uh, we created a Raspberry Pi shield, which is a very, very simple shield with uh, just uh, OLED uh, display and, and buttons. And when you put this on a Raspberry Pi uh, and run a Trezor uh, software written in Python, the whole thing exactly uh, starts to behave exactly like Trezor. So you have something like a uh, Trezor emulator written in Python, but it, it, it uses the same, uh, same workflow. It uh, uses the same USB communication. And this uh, Raspberry Pi shield is now being sent to client developers like Jim Burton and Mike Hearn from Multibit, uh, Alan Reiner from Armory, and well, Marek is working on projects, so <laughs> he already has it, and Thomas from Electrum fame. And uh, the, the, these people uh, are, or, or at least will start very soon on integrating Trezor into uh, mainline version of their clients. So we really hope that once Trezor hits the market, the, all these clients will learn how to use it. But, uh, but we need your help. Why? We need to prepare large-scale production uh, and most or most expensive part of this is to create a casting mode for plastic cases. And we also need to integrate the software with existing clients. We, I, like I said, we already have uh, agreement with these guys on the previous slides, but there are new, new and new uh, clients uh, appearing, and we really need to guide these people how to implement the Trezor support correctly. So how you can support us? Uh, you can uh, pre-order one of the Trezors or more on our website, which is bitcointrezor.com. Currently, we offer classic version, which is a plastic one, or metallic uh, version, which is uh, made of uh, aluminum. And uh, these, <coughs> these Trezors are planned to be delivered in uh, either November in a plastic case or October this year uh, in metallic case. And if you have more questions that we will not answer here, you can go to our FAQ on our website. And also we have a special FAQ for developers, which is on a, on a separate, separate address. And I can, I can show you uh, the Raspberry Pi shield we have. Some, some of uh, probably you were asking if we have a if we have a working trezor, well, we have, but uh, it's uh, it's in. A we we have a couple of working exemplars, but they are in various state of testing <laughs> or crash crash testing, to be to be honest. And uh, Raspberry Pi shields look like looks like this, so I probably haven't seen it good on on a on a projector. So. Sorry? One step back. Just add a rotary encoder to the button. And then you can enter, for example, your pin by rotating from 0 to 9 and pressing and things like that. It's, uh, it's too late to do some hardware changes now. Uh, uh, well, you know. So uh, let me just just finish. We have entered the question and answers round. So f feel free to prepare a question while we we deal with this. <laughs> so so we are.
problem uh, I, or you, you think that the, yes. the pin code is not uh, yes. is no, not uh, uh, secured enough so Yes, but uh, then uh, you are protected by OTP, which you can. Okay, but then, then maybe I can, can attack the next, next session and know. Uh, so I have one credential, I have again one credential is more. And so this is the, the point. That well, if you, if, you don't, uh, if you don't provide the correct OTP, you will never get to the point of uh, entering your PIN code. Yeah, the, the the point the, the main security of Trezor is that the private keys the never never leave the device. It's uh, you are you, you can you can sniff the communication and the security will not be lower. So pin code is just for uh, it, it, it not adds security in, in a way you, you, you mean it's, it, it's meant to be added, but... So, so normal method is something that you know is a pin code, something that you have is a token. So you have pin code plus token. So I could, for example, steal your pin code at the internet cafe, then I uh, smash, give, you, give you a smack in the face and steal your treasure. But how, how would you... Okay, we, we can discuss later. Pro there are probably some other questions. Sorry. So, yeah. I have a question. Uh, what's the target market for this? Is it consumers or consumers and businesses? Uh, it's mainly consumer and businesses. Uh, if, you are not, if you are not able to uh, secure a computer because either you use Windows or you are not a technical savvy person, then you are probably a target. And of course, uh, it's good to have some Bitcoins to have Trezor for it. So it's it's for non non technical savvy people that want to have bitcoins, basically. Um, you mentioned that uh, there was a vulnerability that you didn't actually know what it was to be dealt with the transaction you're signing when you confirm uh, on the device itself because a compromised client would present a different transaction. Yes. If, if, you, if you don't have a display, you have uh, no way of knowing if you, the, the transaction you are signing is, is the one you think you are signing. Right. So uh, once you have a display, you can confirm that the transaction that's shown on your desktop is the same that arrived to Trezor and you are signing. Oh, okay, so it does display a transaction. Uh, it, it, does, it, does, it does display. I, I, was just yeah, I probably so didn't make it ena clear enough that uh, I, I was referring to the smart cards without display. So it, that, that's the main reason for adding a display. Yes? Yes? You mean if 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 someone steals uh, steals your trezor, then w how can he c get to the bitcoin? C get to bitcoins or? Well, 
basically, Bitcoin wallet, Bitcoin Trezor, or any other Bitcoin wallet, is just storage for your private keys. So what what you do is uh, you load this seed to some software or hardware wallet and send it to someone some somewhere else. So the old Trezor is now useless because it has the private keys, but they don't have a possession of any any Bitcoins. So I if you if you did didn't uh, send bitcoins to some other location. The attacker still could use old trezor because he he has private key to to these bitcoins. But once you send it to another trezor or to another wallet, then it's useless. Uh, yes. Uh, what about firmware updates? Uh, how do you manage this? If you want to update it once, and is there any way to kind of uh, get back the seed uh, if you, for example, forget about uh, writing it down? Uh, I will start with the second question. Uh, no, there's no way. One, once you have lost the seed, then the bitcoins are, well, no, they are not gone, but you don't have access to them. Uh, and that's <coughs> uh, in, in order to, to get to the seed, you will have to open the case, which is quite hard or even impossible because it's designed in a way that uh, it's, it can't be open. Sorry? Like Sorry? You can open everything, but milling, for example, you can JTAG everything. Uh, with regards to JTAG, there, there, is a, there is a mechanism on ARM chips that uh, this allows uh, you from reading uh, via, via JTAG. Uh, Basically, uh, or let me let me say another thing. There are companies in China where you basically send them locked chip, and in a few weeks they will uh, re read the flash. But the thing is, once you don't have Trezor, you probably should move your Bitcoin somewhere else. And we, are, you are basically playing against time. And we try to uh, make this. Uh, effort of getting private keys of the Trezor as hard as possible. So there are ways and we know we, we can't achieve 100% security, but at least we can uh, expand this time to, to weeks. And you are probably smart enough to see that you are missing your Trezor for a couple of weeks. Yeah? Uh, yeah. Uh, Actually, that's something uh, Marek is investigating right now. I'm not sure if if this payment protocol is uh, accepted or it's in a draft state. But uh, if uh, if it's uh, accepted, then we will probably want want to do it because uh, it's much more convenient for users to see uh, host names instead of uh, Bitcoin addresses. And uh, I remembered you had two questions, yes. so we want to. Uh, yeah. Uh, the firmware update, what we plan to do right now is uh, to have a special uh, bootloader uh, on a device which will allow you to uh, update uh, the firmware in a device via USB. Uh, what we are struggling or, well, we, we basically have decided, but some people don't, don't like the idea, is that we will check the signature of the firmware via uplo uh, while uploading it. So. Basically, you can't put uh, any random firmware downloaded from the internet. The thing is, we will also send or sell the bare PCB hardware, where you can do whatever you want. But the device, as we as sold uh, right now, like the whole, will have this locked bootloader. In order to, to you know, <coughs> it, it's basically. Uh, Security for for the end users. I, if you order Trezor for, from some uh, third-party vendor, uh, he could have uh, used a different firmware. While if we have if we have uh, this measure, we can say like this this device is running our firmware and it hasn't been tampered with. And if you have a third-party device, you can also load that firmware. Sorry. Uh, could you be more specific about so third-party so device? So, I, so if, I do, if I have a bootloader that doesn't, doesn't have this protection, I can also load your hard, your, so your firmware. 
Yes, of course. Of course you can. So how does the customer decide between the original or fake device? I will also ship the same device uh, that if you ship maybe... If you, if you ship a fake device with yeah. our firmware, I'm perfectly fine with it. I just want to be sure that if, if the device says it's being made by us, then the so firmware is also the being made. Device can also say this. Sorry? The fake device can also say it's made by us. <laughs> no. Yes, uh, our devices will have a hologram on it and a serial number, so you can check on the website if it's uh, if it's really made by us. I I don't know who was first, but you can. Yeah, we, we had we had discussion. We had discussion about this, and there are ways how to pin enter pin even even with one button. But we have to make compromise between. Uh, Th there were some questions over there. Yeah. Why haven't you started the Kickstarter in the first place? Uh, yes. Uh, we at the Bitcoin conference in San Francisco, we said there will be a Kickstarter project, but uh, then we basically gave them all materials needed to com to start a campaign, and uh, then for two weeks nothing happened. Like we we wrote them two m two mails every day. We have. Uh, uh, written them via Kickstarter, uh, sorry, uh, Twitter and Facebook, and there was absolutely no reaction. And then after two weeks, they were like, oh, we really like the project, but you should be more specific about that part and that part. So we uh, expanded that uh, text description, and then they didn't like a different part. And every, every this exchange of email were like another four days, and we were like, uh, Get getting the feeling that we really should do something because people are expecting that we we announced that at uh, the conference, so we decided to cancel the whole Kickstarter thing, and now we are basically having these pre-orders via uh, via bitcoins. Yeah. Yep. How many pre-orders do you have, and how many devices will you build? Uh, you can ask the details at info at bitcointresor dot com. <laughs> I'm, I I don't have the current numbers, but. <laughs> I think that's not necessary. You can just send your bitcoins to some somewhere else. Like th that's th that's probably the best best measure. If you're faster than the person that stole it. Mm, and this this log would work. Uh, how exactly? Just uh, just that you uh, the faster won't work without log. If your client would have to send it automatically. Uh, yeah, we, we, we can we can talk about that, that later. I, I I'm not sure I'm getting the idea. So, no, over here. yeah, sorry. Uh, that person was before me, and then I. Uh, okay. So, which which person was before you? Uh, he was before me. Uh, I had a question. Uh, will you support mobile devices? Sorry. Uh, will you support mobile devices also? Um, uh, we uh, we currently support uh, mobile devices which have OTG. So uh, if they can uh, behave like USB hosts, there is no reason why we shouldn't support them. But we, because we have no battery, and we are really not uh, aiming right now at the mobile devices, pr like r old phones, then it's, <coughs> it's not uh, supported if you don't have OTG. Because we think that security is much bigger problem than the mobility of payments. Like you can, you can use, you can use uh, uh, software wallets on your or on your Android phone. If you have just few few bitcoins there, it's it's okay. But if you want to 
securely store more bitcoins, then that, that's a much much bigger problem. Yeah. If your mobile phone supports uh, USB host, and most of the new new Android phones do, then you should be okay. If uh, wallet developers for Android will implement Trezor. So b when I was showing the workflow uh, in, one in, in a handshake, there will be a master public key exported, so the client knows which addresses uh, are basically stored in in, uh, in Trezor. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, we we currently support both uh, uh, Electrum scheme and BIP32, which is much more. Uh, C complex and better, <laughs> and ma maybe if uh, if bit bit forty two will have uh, wider adoption by November, then we might completely skip the Electrum scheme. I think that would be a good idea. Uh, the qu sorry, the question was uh, there is an, another open platform uh, very similar to Trezor, and uh, the question was if, if we are open for a partnership to, to allow running this software on third party devices. Yeah, we, we should definitely talk later. What's the name of the device? Or it's magic dongle. Magic dongle. Okay. Yes, please. But it's not uh, right now. Uh, you can, can I do as an alternative to uh, get the seed from outside into the Trezor instead of having it generated? Uh, we were also discussing about this, and we we don't like the idea that the the seed is generated outside of of the device because. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, during the initialization phase, there is uh, entropy from computer being uh, sent to Trezor as well, and Trezor is using this entropy and its own entropy together. I will have to think about it. I am not aware if there are such schemes. Uh, yeah, I will have to investigate into it. But the plan is to use at least two, uh, at least two uh, sources of entropy, and one one is our own, and the second one is being sent via the initialization phase message. To be honest, I I don't I I'm not. Yeah, that 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 that's the way that's uh, obvious. But uh, we, we, you know. Yeah, yeah. We 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 were thi thinking about uh, also importing the whole seat, but I think it's uh, abandoned in in for the sake of security. Have I seen some hands over there? Okay, so f that's all, and uh, oh, maybe the last one. Uh, it is available. I have two of them here uh, for sale, uh, and uh, and we have a e-shop running on our website where you can uh, order more. And th the thing is, we we made a quite small batch of them, around twenty. And they are mostly gone f for these developers. 
and now we are trying to uh, to gather uh, orders. So, so once we have like 50 of them, we can we can, we can make another batch. So it's not like we have to wait for 500 uh, or more. Yeah. Uh, maybe as a last final presentation, uh, <laughs> there's a follow-up workshop tomorrow about uh, tokens, hardware tokens. Uh, so if anyone wants to discuss hardware tokens, uh, tomorrow at uh, 8 p.m. in Neue Square, 10-2. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's good. So it's 8 p.m. tomorrow. Okay, thank you. And if you have any more questions, <laughs> yeah. if you have any more questions, then feel free to meet me here. <laughs>